Well, good day to everyone joining us and welcome to today's webinar. Today's talk is entitled Rare Disease Research, Conducting Clinical Trials Where the Patients Are. My name is Andrew Jordan and I'll be your host for today. Today's webinar will run for approximately 60 minutes and this presentation includes a Q&A session with our speakers. This webinar is designed to be interactive and webinars work best when you're involved, so please feel free to submit questions and comments for our speakers throughout the presentation using the questions chat box. And we'll try to attend to your questions during the Q&A session. This chat box is located in the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. And if you require any assistance, please contact me at any time by sending a message using that chat panel. And at this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. And please note that this event will be recorded and made available to you for future download. And at this point, I would like to thank Premier Research, who helped develop the content for this presentation. Premier Research is a CRO serving highly innovative biotech, pharmaceutical, and medical device companies. The company has a wealth of experience in rare disease and pediatric research, having managed about 100 projects in the, each area in the last five years alone, and operates in 84 countries and employs more than 1,000 professionals. All right, well now I would like to introduce our speakers for today's event. Allison Sampson has over 20 years of clinical research experience, including roles as CRA, project manager, senior project manager, and project director, covering phases one through four global studies. As an experienced project manager, she's led both clinical and cross-functional teams. She's worked in all phases of clinical research, including global phase three studies as a global project manager. She has experience of a wide variety of therapeutic areas with particular expertise in pediatrics and neonates, oncology, medical devices, and rare diseases. Her work experience includes roles in biotechs, blue chip pharma, and CROs. Now prior to entering clinical research, Dr. Sampson trained as a chemist and she's a fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry. She achieved chartered scientist status in February of 2009 through the Institute of Clinical Research. And our second speaker for today, Hannah Wide, has over eight years of experience of project management, clinical research, and a large portion of her professional career has been dedicated to rare indications. She's worked as program and project manager for clinical trials in rare indication including both adult and pediatric populations. She's worked on global studies with significant experience of working in the Middle East and North Africa region. Hannah has been involved in rare disease feasibility, protocol review, study and program management, CRF review, management of the clinical team, vendor management, and a range of other activities. Hannah has a Master of Science in Medical Biology from Linköping University in Sweden. And prior to joining Premier Research, Hannah has worked in clinical research project management at QED Clinical Services and Quintiles. And now it's with my pleasure to hand the microphone over to our first speaker for today, and that's Dr. Allison Sampson. And Allison, you can begin your presentation when ready. So good morning and good afternoon everybody. Um, thank you very much for joining this webinar. In the webinar we aim to give you an overview of some of the challenges associated with successfully conducting rare disease trials and some of the proposed mitigations. So we're going to cover the following areas. We're going to provide an overview of rare disease clinical research, where to find rare disease patients, working with sites where the patients are and how to support these sites and then we will cover recruitment and retention of rare disease patients and how we ensure that their data are of the highest quality. So a rare disease is also referred to as an orphan disease and it's any disease that affects a small percentage of the population. Most rare diseases are genetic, 
and are present throughout a person's entire life, even if symptoms are not always apparent. Many rare diseases appear in early life, and about 30% of children with rare disease will die before reach, reaching their fifth birthday. No single cutoff number has been agreed for which rare disease is considered, so rare or ultra rare. A disease may be considered rare in one part of the world or in a particular group of people, but still be common in another. In the United States, the Rare Disease Act of 2002 defines rare disease strictly according to prevalence. Specifically, any disease or condition that affects fewer than 200,000 people in the United States, or about one in one and a half thousand people. In Japan, the legal definition of a rare disease is one that affects fewer than 50,000 patients in Japan, or about one in two and a half thousand people. The European Commission on Public Health defines rare disease as life-threatening or chronically debilitating diseases which are of such low prevalence that special combined efforts are needed to address them. The term low prevalence is defined as generally meaning fewer than one in 2,000 people. So definitions of rare disease in, in the literature um, vary and they range from one in 1,000 to one in 200,000 with ultra-rare often used to describe those diseases that are least common. So globally, around 350 million people are living with rare disease. So really the message is that rare disease is not that rare. <laughs> However, the lack of available treatments leaves patients and their families desperately searching for new treatment options. The high cost of developing a drug a very small number of patients has meant that pharmaceutical companies are reluctant to develop drugs for rare disease unless there's adequate financial return. Often drug legislation has been passed in many countries with the aim of providing financial incentives such as extended exclusivity to encourage the development of drugs which otherwise might lack a sufficient profit motive. Developing drugs for rare disease remains extremely expensive. And even with the possibility of wealth and drug status, it is a strategy that is not without risk for many drug companies. Therefore, it is crucial that any rare disease trial is carefully planned and thought out so that it delivers quality data which can adequately answer the questions of safety and efficacy of the drug in question. Protocols may have observational arms or adaptive designs or may accommodate an exploratory approach. Frequently, the protocol design is bespoke or has bespoke assessments. Because of the rarity of the disease, patient recruitment is usually a challenge, since by definition, there are few potential patients. This may also translate into longer than average timelines for recruitment, with high numbers of participating countries and sites. All these factors lead to raising the cost of recruiting and retaining rare disease patients compared with other diseases, a cost that can spiral up to 2,400% more than a regular patient. So now I'm moving on to um, discuss where we find rare disease patients. By definition, rare disease patients are small in number and often they are hard to identify for clinical trials. There are a number of strategies we have used at Premier Research to mitigate this challenge. First is to identify key opinion leaders in the rare disease area. These may already be known to sponsor companies. These specialist healthcare providers are usually active in scientific literature and are often in a position to provide expert feedback on elements of the planned trial, such as protocol design. Key opinion leaders may have their own databases of potential patients that they have treated either recently or in the past, or may they may have strong links with other healthcare providers who may potentially refer patients. Another very valuable strategy is to forward links with patient networks or advocacy groups. Most groups are happy to be involved with any new treatment development and can offer practical advice on what it's like to be with a patient with a rare disease, the challenges they face and the suitability of the protocol. They can also provide um, advice such as recruitment tools, what would be empathetic to potential patients. And another key thing that they can do is help raise disease awareness by allowing study information to be posted on their website or social media forums such as Twitter. Finally, there are the so-called hidden patient populations. 
These are patients who have a rare disease that is difficult to diagnose, usually because of the development of um, multiple symptoms, which at least at first may point to other diseases. Any recruitment campaigns in this area should have a strong focus on the patient diagnosis. So now moving to working with sites where the patients are. In many rare diseases, it's not possible to expect patients and their families to travel distances to appropriate participating sites due to the severity of their disease. Many rare disease patients are very sick. Therefore, in these diseases, the only option is to work with sites where the patients are located, even if they are research naive. So selecting the best countries and sites has a widespread, widespread and positive impact on the likelihood of study completion. When considering countries and sites, the following um, should, should be um, considered. So the regulatory framework. Regulatory guidelines and ethical requirements may differ from country to country, or even amongst regions within a country. So it's important that these are taken into account in the planning phase of the trial. Import-export requirements. Many countries have complicated import-export requirements, particularly with regard to shipment of investigational products. So the appreciation of these requirements is very important, as it can be a rate-limiting step to opening up patient recruitment. When planning a rare disease clinical trial, it's critical for sponsors and study planning teams to be aware of the current global, regional, and country-specific standards of care with regard to the indica indication under investigation. Existing treatment patterns and guidelines for the disease may vary widely from country to country, and a specialist in site type may, may differ as well. So for example, in some areas, pediatric patients with rare diseases may be seen, may be seen by adult specialists due to the low incidence of the disease. In other areas, patients with rare disease may be referred to a central site to be evaluated by key specialists. Therefore, factors related to standard of care and associated patient pathways can have a significant impact on site selection. The clinical trial experience of site investigators and the potential for patient recruitment. Some countries, such as Iran, do not allow FDA inspectors to travel to investigative sites. Therefore, for countries like this, Sponsors must ensure that the quality of data and the documentation is sufficiently rigorous to meet competent authority requirements. So if possible, face-to-face -face investigator meetings should be conducted in a country with a sponsor and all the participating sites can travel freely. And then finally, site and patient reimbursement, which we'll talk about um, in depth later. Um, countries may have quite different regulations and processes for site and patient reimbursement. And it's important that sponsors make sure that they comply with both GCP and local regulatory and ethical guidelines. So sometimes the disease is so rare that the patient population is widely geographically scattered. In this case, it can make economic sense to recruit patients in one country and cover their expense to visit a trial site in another. Important considerations in doing this include checking that the clinical trial insurance covers the patient in both locations, informing appropriate bodies such as the ethics committee at both clinics or the patient's, partic patient's participation, and then facilitating and covering the patient's travel expenses up front so that the patient is not unduly stressed by, or um, that their sickness is made worse or that they're out of pocket in terms of participation. While many rare disease trials are conducted at large academic institutions with extensive research experience, rare disease investigators often do not have hands-on experience with industry-sponsored industry research. Quite, free, quite often, um, rare disease sites will have done some academic research. An evaluation of the capabilities of the site is important. This will influence the level of training the site needs to, re to receive. For many sites not used to commercial research, the rigors of the clinical trial process is often a shock. So the need for thorough and effective site training in rare disease studies cannot be overemphasized, as not only every patient, but actually also every data point is key. The sites must have a comprehensive understanding of study requirements prior to enrolling their first patient, and there's a need to maintain the same compliance and quality of data throughout the duration of the study. 
A good time to train site staff is at the investigator meeting. And for complex studies, it's unwise not to include at least one day a face-to-face -face meeting. But it's important to abide by any local regulations surrounding investigator meetings, for example, the US Sunshine Act. Now I'm going to present um, a case study, a rare disease um, in pediatrics. The primary research is currently managing a multi-center, multinational pediatric and adult but, um, disease program for an orphan drug used in the treatment of alkaline phosphatase deficiency. This program is currently being conducted in North America, Europe, Asia, and the Middle East. Enrollment is now complete and patients are being followed up. For this study, in the more obscure regions of the world, every patient was critical. And those who were not within close proximity to a study site were treated with compassionate um, drug use until their travel to a participating site became feasible. So here you'll see um, some of the challenges we faced and some of the solutions. And I'll just touch on some of these. So in this study, we opened up sites when we identified patients. We literally went to where the patients were. There was a continuous rolling startup and site selection process. When we couldn't open sites up fast enough, we sent patients from one country to another. We had Czech patients treated in the UK, Romanian patients treated in Italy, and Polish patients treated in Germany. The logistical challenges for this study were huge, with documents being translated throughout the study into multiple languages. And the documents include things like full protocol translations, investigator brochures, so as we opened up a new country, a whole raft of um, doc study documents would need to be translated. To um, further add to complexity, the protocol was am amended multiple times and we're, we're currently working with Amendment 10. So to mitigate this, we utilized the central portal to train both the CRA team and the site staff in real time. Because of the global nature of this study, um, it needed to be managed 24-7. So the study team were, team were carefully chosen from around the world to make this possible. In some countries, the startup period was extremely long, for example, Argentina and Russia. And we had to um, factor this into the study planning. Further challenges included the requirement for patient self-injection which in some cases we had to mitigate by sending a home care nurse to the patient's house. Cultural differences also had to be observed. Travel expenses were very high in Saudi Arabia where it was required for a male family member to accompany a mother and a, and a child um, to the clinic. So a realistic projection of patient expenses um, was definitely required. What this global study illustrates is the need for rare disease studies for careful proactive planning and training and really the ability to think out of the box for both expected and unexpected challenges. So now I'm going to hand over to my colleague Hannah and she will talk to you about supporting sites. Thank you Alison. Good morning and good afternoon everyone. Thank you for joining today. As Alison mentioned, in-depth study training is the cornerstone of a high quality site and for ADC studies some of the site may be industry sponsor or even GCP naive. So it is highly recommended that sponsoring for face-to-face -face investigator meetings for training on the protocol GCP and specific study procedures, including blood collection and investigational product management. We also recommend doing informed consent workshops if the patient population is pediatric and considered vulnerable to ensure a thorough and consistent informed consent process. In addition, recorded training sessions can be used on demand as refresher courses or to train new site staff. For longer studies, additional investigator meetings, webinars, and other scheduled or ad hoc meetings may be useful for maintaining interest among the sites. This is particularly important in rare disease studies where it may be very few patients enrolled per site. In a rare disease study, the number of participating patients is often so low that it's not only that every patient counts, but every data point. When study procedures are complex or bespoke, we sometimes do a dummy run at the site after the SIV, but before the first patient is enrolled, for the site to go through all study procedures for a visit and to address any questions or concerns ahead of time. 
Building a strong relationship between the CRA and the site may help site staff to feel more confident in the study protocol. And for rare disease studies, it is also important for the sponsor to have a personal relationship with the sites, both to encourage the site study participation and to promote the study program in the long run, as the sites often participate in several studies within the development program and may then be the primary key opinion leaders when the drug reaches market approval. So, looking at recruitment and retention of rare disease participants. <coughs> As with all clinical trials, the starting point to identify rare disease patients is in knowing the patient pathways, which may vary widely in different countries depending on incidence and healthcare setup. While rare disease patients may be treated by specialists and key opinion leaders in some countries, they may be treated in more general settings in others. Once the sites have been chosen, re the recruitment potential for each site and country needs to be maximized using site database review, patient outreach tools, and referral pathways. It is key to try to maximize patient number per site and country, as this increases data quality and decreases the financial risk to the sponsor. To find patients not currently associated with study or referral sites or the hidden population that Alison was speaking about earlier, Patients can be guided to the study via patient groups or advertisements as appropriate. It is also key to recruitment to know the local regulations, not only for startup process, but to ensure that the patients can be adequately reimbursed for the time and travel, as this is key to study compliance. And this may vary significantly, especially in countries that are fairly naive in conducting industry-sponsored trials. A common strategy to build clinical trial and rare disease awareness among potential investigators and sites is to give, them the give the study an identity or brand. Carefully done, this can reflect some of the aspirations of the study. Developing a proactive recruitment strategy is essential to ensuring that the study patient profile is known to all colleagues and healthcare professionals who may potentially refer patients to partic participating study sites. A strong study image with a memorable name or logo is also helpful for referring investigators. For rare pediatric studies, the protocol requirements will be very important to the family's decision to participate in the study. In order to design a protocol attractive to pediatric patients or to other rare patients and their families, it is important to have early engagement with appropriate advocacy group and use advisory groups as appropriate who have access to input from affected families and often link with the key opinion leaders. Of equal importance is the need to involve the regulatory authorities at an early stage to obtain agreement on study design and endpoints and to present them with the feedback from the advocacy groups. Our recommendation is to implement a recruitment, referral and awareness campaign from the start of the study Depending on the study design, the campaign materials might include referral packs with electronic letter and fact sheets to share with potential referrers to explain the study rationale. Inclusion exclusion cards with key inclusion criteria to assist the sites with screening. MINIC protocols, a tabbed A5 version of the MINIC protocol to help site staff find the key section with ease and assist with compliance of the study. Parental leaflets to use in pediatric studies adapted for parents of potential patients to provide an overview of the study prior to the consent process. Patient invitation letters, a letters to be sent from the site to the parents or to the potential patients already known to the site together with the patient leaflet. Clinic poster or flyer to be placed in clinics to raise general awareness of the study. The same graphic may be used and just printed in different sizes. We also recommend that a global study website is put in place, which can include disease and study information and can also act as a pre-screening tool. It can also link with advocacy groups and forums for maximal visibility. And if any advertisement is done for the study, this should also be linked to the global study website so that it can be tracked which type of advertisement is working and which is not. The web page could also have a dedicated section for the site staff where they can find information about the study and get updates on the study progress.
Our experience has taught us that well-informed patients are more likely to be retained in a study. We provide sites with clear and attractive tools to assist the consent process, including an informed consent flip chart, inclusive exclusion cards, and a detailed patient brochure. These are intended to facilitate the informed consent process and to maximize ch chances of a potential patient becoming an enrolled patient. To consent to the study, we believe that potential patients will need reassurance and a clear understanding of what's required of them in terms of study participation. The patient may have concerns about their prognosis in general and the progression of their disease. Some patients may also be anxious about the study requirements, for example, the blood draws, and perceive the visit and assessment schedule as a burden which is competing with family obligations, work or education. Providing patients with detailed study information can mitigate anxiety. Premier research can advise on methods that have worked well previously in rare disease studies. For example, producing a well thought out customized patient information leaflet is definitely recommended. Information given to the patient should clearly specify the frequency and length of the clinic visit. It should also detail what procedures will be performed and how long they will take and describe any discomfort that the procedure may cause. For rare disease studies, there is often an urgent or unmet medical need to give patients an innate motivation to continue on the study. Nevertheless, it is still extremely important to pay close attention to providing appropriate patient and family support and eliminating as much of the study burden as possible. Sponsors may take exceptional measures to ensure that patients are able to participate and stay in the trial. Some of the more general things to consider in rare disease trials uh, patient travel, minimizing out-of-pocket expenses, and arranging home visits when possible. Reimbursement of travel, meals, and other out-of-pocket expenses should be streamlined to minimize the financial strain on the patient. And whenever possible, we recommend using any of the prepaid cards available that can be provided to the patients, which they can use to avoid the issue of out-of-pocket expenses altogether. In addition to providing reimbursement to, for standard out-of-pocket expenses such as meals and local travel, which may be required by some institutional review boards or ethics committees for certain indication, it may be necessary to provide long distance travel and or relocation costs for patients and their families to travel from their homes to a faraway center of excellencies. For example, we have seen trials where a patient and his or her family may be needed to be flown from the Middle East to a treatment center in the UK and then flown home again when the treatment is completed. The logistics are complicated and regulations may require approval from ethics committees in both countries, but study success may hinge on managing this process effectively. To that end, sponsors of rare disease studies should be sure to incorporate travel and support into the study budget, as Alison mentioned previously. To substitute site visits to home visits whenever possible will minimize the burden of clinical trial participation on the patients and their families and may also be effective in saving both time and expense for the sponsor. For example, in trials where injection of the IP is required, having a home care nurse train patients to self-administer the IP reduces the number of visits required as long as the patient is able to comply with the study guidelines. Experience has shown that patients and caregivers are better to develop self-administration techniques and overcome any fear they may have of injections when their injection training is done in the comfort of their own home. In-home training can then be supplemented with an instructional video on self-injections. It is also important to find a good balance between pro protocol requirements and patient participation. For example, weighing the number of clinic visits and time on site against the inconvenience and expense associated with travel. If travel ex is extremely difficult from a logistical or cost standpoint, sponsors may want to consider opening a site that is closer to where the patient lives. To support the retention of these patients, it is important that the patient support strategy is flexible and caters for the needs of the individual patients. This can include everything from support with childcare, accompanied travel in less stable regions like the Lebanese countryside or eastern Ukraine, or even something as mundane as providing dog walking. As mentioned, with a very limited patient population, data quality in clinical trial is absolutely 
absolute key, and every data point is vital for the success of this study. In addition to the importance of patient compliance with study visits and procedures, which we have already discussed, the site's data entry into the electronic case report form needs to be accurate, correct, and timely. The data for each patient needs to be monitored as soon as possible to identify any issues, protocol deviations, and to ensure that no errors included in the ECRS are spread throughout other information systems. The CRAs at Premier Research are trained and experienced in critical data source document verification, log checking, query management, and audit trials specifically for rare disease studies. As there is no possibility for the site to learn on the first patient, different tactics can be employed to ensure data quality. We have already discussed the possibility to do a dummy run before the first patient. Another approach recommended when we know in advance when the first patient will come in is to have a monitor on site during the first patient dosing to assist the site in real time. This is especially recommended if the visit is complex, for example, in a PK study. Every rare disease study is going to have unique complexities and challenges, whether it is the patient population under investigation, like in pediatric studies, the procedure involved, such as specialty laboratory tests or home care visits, or the number of regions, countries, and languages involved. Each of these different study characteristics may have an impact on the requirements for a study CRA team. According to our Director of Global Resourcing at Premier Research, the key skills to look for when assigning CRAs to a rare disease study include critical thinking skills. CRAs do more than simply check data. They need to understand how to solve problems, who to contact for guidance on complex issues, and when to involve the sponsor, all while protecting the regulatory stringency of the trial. The need to have experience in monitoring studies in complex indications. Since rare diseases are, well, rare, clinical experience in them is rare as well. Sponsors should take care to select CRAs who can quickly learn the nuances of a rare disease patient population and their treatment. If possible, CRAs should receive specific training on working in rare disease studies. It may also be useful to train CRAs on dealing with sites that have never participated in industry-sponsored research as working with these sites has its own challenges. The CRAs also need to have confidence. To be helpful to sites, CRAs need to be able to provide confident guidance to key opinion leaders and their staff to navigate the complexities of academic centers without feeling intimidated. It may also be important for sponsors to partner with a flexible organization that has the global reach to provide quality monitors in the countries of interest. In rare disease studies, closely managing data completeness, data quality, and protocol violations is perhaps the most critical topic covered during monitor training. With very few eligible study patients, every patient counts, and it's critical to take every possible measure to ensure that all patient data is usable for the analysis. Therefore, CRAs, clinical, and data management staff must carefully monitor any trends or risk to the data. For example, missing endpoint data, so that follow-up training and corrective and or preventive action can be implemented in response to any findings without delay. Many rare disease studies have frequent data and safety monitoring board meetings, which increases the importance of timely data entry by the sites, something that is sometimes a challenge, especially in industry research naive sites. Sites should be trained that data must be entered within 48 to 72 hours of the actual subject visit. In order to monitor site performance, sponsors may want to develop and track metrics for site responsiveness, such as timelines in data entry and query responses. Sponsors should keep in mind that the data monitoring strategy implemented at the beginning of a trial is unlikely to remain static for the life of the study. Some sites will not perform as well as expected, others will surpass projections, and in addition, site staff turnover may change the performance of sites throughout the study. No single strategy will be able to predict and account for the dynamics of real-world clinical trials. Thus, the monitoring plan must have periodic re-evaluations built into it 
for the duration of the clinical trial program. When using a contract research organization, it is recommended to use a pool of monitoring visits rather than set times to ensure that monitoring visits can be scheduled when neither needed rather than having a strict schedule such as monitoring a site every six to eight weeks. In summary, data entry, monitoring and query review and responses needs to be accurate and timely, even more so, so in rare disease studies than in many common disease studies. Identification of trends and retraining based on protocol violations need to be timely and effective to ensure data quality. Finally, data management need to review the data on an ongoing basis starting with the first patient enrolled to ensure that no data irregularities are allowed to go unquestioned and that a site is notified of any errors in a timely manner to make every effort that no mistake is ever done twice. So that was everything we have uh, for the presentation, so we will be happy to open up for questions. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for that, Hannah. Also, thank you to Allison for her portion of the presentation. Now, at this point, I would like to invite our audience to continue sending their questions and comments in right now using that questions window for this, which is the Q&A portion of the webinar, of course. And I've already received some questions here, so let's get started with our first question. How important is it to engage advocacy groups? Hi, this is Hannah. Our experience is that engaging advocacy groups is often key to a successful rare disease program. Um, we have already discussed the help that they can give in increasing study awareness. We have often seen that a majority of patients are coming through these advocacy groups, um, especially if we ha have many patients that we're trying to recruit that are not geographically near the actual study sites. It can be key to, to engage the advocacy groups for this. We have also seen that they can help on a much wider scale. When um, submitting orphan drugs for approval, patient advocacy groups are key to, to provide recommendations and lobbying the organizations that make these decisions. Patient advocacy groups can also aid patient recruitment and retention by early protocol review so that they can look at the protocol and see if this is actually something that they, their members can comply with so that any big things that pops up that would make the patient non-compliant can be identified before the protocol is even finalized. We have uh, used uh, the connections with advocacy groups uh, for active promotion of the study, like Alison was mentioning during the presentation, to ask them to link to the study websites on their website or blogs and in any other forums that they use, if they have a newsletter they send out, if they do Twitter, Facebook, and so on. And on one study we've been working on, we've even gone so far as to have a representative of a patient advocacy group involved in a study oversight group that met once a month and where major study decisions were discussed together with the chief investigator for the study, the sponsor, the CRO, but also a representative from the patient advocacy group to ensure that all major study decisions that were taken did have the, the patients in mind. Right. Well, thank you for that, Hannah. Sounds like it could be a key resource. Our next question here, uh, why is data quality so important in rare disease trials? So I'll take this one. This is Alison here. Um, so in rare disease trials, um, typically the patient numbers are, are small because obviously the, the disease is rare. So we're looking at um, data from relatively small patient cohorts. and Obviously, if um, you're only looking at, say, 20 patients and there was an issue with two patients' worth of data, then, you know, that's a significant amount of your study data. Um, so it's really key, as, as Hannah um, mentioned, to stay on top of um, data queries and any um, trends in missing data, such as endpoints, etc., so that um, we capture every um, data point um, that's required and capture it so that it's of high quality um, so that the the overall study database is not placed at risk. 
Okay, well, thank you for that, Austin. Uh, moving to the next question. What are the challenges with working with inexperienced sites? Right, this is Hannah. So sites can be inexperienced in different ways, but if we're looking at working with sites who are used to industry-sponsored trial or are in regions where GCP compliance is less developed, let's say, uh, these sites really need to be thoroughly trained on even basic clinical research standards such as timely CRF completion, the importance of timely lab processing and shipment. Um, sometimes they need to be trained on the informed consent process and safety reporting, just to mention a few of the, of the things that when working with experienced uh, sites we can take for granted, but here we really need to train these sites in the very, very basics. And it's also worth considering that when we're looking at countries where the GCP is not as developed as in, in many of the European and uh, Northern American countries, it may also be difficult to find CRAs that have the required level of knowledge to support these sites properly. So even the CRAs need to be trained as well as the sites. And it's also good to consider to provide the training sometimes in local language to ensure that everyone really understands it. It can be a key point to actually translate study manuals uh, so that everyone can read in the local language and really follow the instructions on how to how to do everything. So yeah, I think the, the most important thing is to really evaluate what level these sites are at and make sure that the training and the follow-up and monitoring that goes on really takes this into account. Okay, thanks for that, Hannah. Sounds like there are lots of points there to consider. Uh, another question here, what lengths have you gone to recruit and retain rare disease patients? All right, so this is Hannah again. Well, I guess the key is, as I mentioned, to individualize the support for the individual patients on the trial that you're working on. So, I mean, I've worked in some countries where travel have been restricted or unsafe and to help providing safe transportation can be a really key to getting the patients um, to the site. Uh, one example was a study where I was working on in Lebanon where the sites were in very safe areas of the major city in Lebanon, but the Lebanese countryside had a lot of um, dangers when it came to travel and the only way to actually get the, pa the patients making the, the few hours trip into the sites was to provide a company and guarded transportation for them because it was too, otherwise they couldn't have attended the site visits. Right. Other barriers that we see a lot of family obligations, especially in pediatric trials where often the whole family accompanies the patient and you need to be supporting the patients and the parents with everything from childcare to pet care to providing video games and movies for the patient's siblings to, to entertain them while the parents are with the patient during assessment. So you, if you really, really want these patients, if they are so rare that every patient you find you need in your trial, you need to be prepared to do everything that's allowed within the country legislation to ensure that these patients and their families can actually comply with all the obligations of the trial. Interesting. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, maybe one last question here. What is the main piece of advice uh, you would give to someone thinking of embarking on a rare disease trial? So this, this is Alison here. Um, really the main piece of advice is to expect the unexpected. Um, rare disease trials um, are a challenge and, and each one is unique. Um, so ahead of even recruiting your first patient, a lot of careful thought and planning needs to go in, into place. And, and that will mitigate some of the challenges, but for sure there'll be some that you will never envisage that, that crop up. Um, as Hannah mentioned, training is really key. Um, in rare disease, because we have to go where the patients are, sites tend to be relatively inexperienced in clinical research and require a lot of training. And probably the final thing I'd say, and it is a key thing as well, is to have an adequate budget. Rare disease trials are very expensive because of all the things that we've mentioned. The fact you've got to, to um, monitor intensively, we've got to train sites, we have to be flexible and do anything that we can to, to recruit and retain patients. 
So um, a realistic expectation of budget is, is also key. Excellent. Okay, well, thank you for that, Alison. And also thank you to Hannah for your answers. We have reached the end of the question and answer portion of this webinar. If we weren't able to attend to your questions today, the team at Premier Research will try to follow up with you after the webinar. And if you have any further questions that you didn't get to ask today, you can email them to the email address showing on your screen right now. That's info at premier-research.com. And thank you everyone for participating in today's conference. You'll be receiving a follow-up email from Xtalks with access to the recorded archive for this event. And a survey window will be popping up on your screen. Your participation is appreciated as it'll help us improve our further webinars. Now I've passed you a link in your chat box. You can use that to tweet thanks to our speakers for today. And I encourage you to do so. That's Allison Sampson and Hannah Wide. We hope that you found this conference informative. Have a great day, everyone.